thank Edgeworth Town for having me here. I've been at your schools all day and enjoying playing with your children. Um, and now we're on for the big show tonight, so I have to take off the jacket. <laughs> oh, somebody might be throwing something at me. <laughs> So, we're at the Midland Science Festival 2017, Edgeworthstown, and my talk is the God Particle, from Flanders Fields to the Higgs Field. So, the European Union's Large Hadron Collider, there it is there. It's based at CERN, um, the CERN Particle Physics Laboratory near Geneva in Switzerland. Um, it's got a 27 kilometer circular accelerator. It's located 100 meters below the ground. It's the world's largest and most expensive laboratory, which is dedicated to the pursuit of fundamental science. On the 4th of July 2012, CERN announced and subsequently confirmed that they had detected a Higgs boson. A particle that physicists have been looking at for the pre for looking for for the pre previous 50 years, when Peter Higgs, and that's what he looked like when he predicted it. This discovery of the Higgs boson is heralded as one of the greatest discoveries of our time. So my lecture tonight is a mixture of science, economics, politics education, and savage indignation. And I think it provides, therefore, a fitting tribute to the legacy of the Edgeworths, of the Edgeworth family, and its contribution to knowledge, science, and human culture over the centuries. There's the Edgeworths. You all know these, you know these better than I do. So let's move on. So, my title is The God Part, from Flanders Fields to the Higgs Field. Now, one of the perceived difficulties in grasping the ideas of modern science and modern physics is that there is no common sense or even classical physics pictures to help visualize them. I'm here to claim that this assertion is false that if we search in other domains, particularly in the symbolic human domain, we can encounter an everyday picture that helps our understanding. So the title of this lecture, Short Circuits, History and Science, and prompts the question, can a scientist, speaking as a scientist, and not as an inadequately informed amateur, legitimately comment on domains other than science, without being a crank or a diligent. <coughs> Can a scientist make meaningful contributions to fields such as history, economics, politics, aesthetics, even, heaven forbid, theology, when he speaks under the condition of science, under the condition of being a scientist? In 1939, Albert Einstein wrote a letter to President F.D. Roosevelt saying roughly that nuclear energy is here, war is inevitable, it is up to you to decide what scientists, what scientists should do about it. So even the pacifist Einstein did not feel he could intrude into the political domain with as much as a suggestion he clearly felt that politics was for politicians and science was for scientists. One of the founders of modern mathematics, George Cantor, discovered a sequence of different types of infinity. The concept of these new infinities was quite distinct from the previous concept of infinity which, in some terms of thought, was fused with the concept of God. Being a good Christian, 
Cantor was disturbed by his discovery. But being a good mathematician, he didn't attempt to hide his discovery. Instead, Cantor also wrote a letter. His letter was to the Pope. Roughly along the lines, my mathematical creation has led to a new quantitative infinity. The real qualitative infinity is only God. So Cantor gave the Pope an extra. And, and the Catholic Church's reply was that God is beyond numbers. <laughs> so these two great thinkers of the late 19th century and the early 20th century were the victims of the horrific academic destiny of specialization where different domains of knowledge are kept partitioned in hermetic isolation, protected by taboos of which the most primitive religions and their witch doctors would be proud. No lecture addressing the world today can avoid mentioning the world of a hundred years ago, which was engaged in the greatest human extermination by humans in history up to that point in what was known as the Great War. The poppy seed has a tendency to lie dormant <coughs> in undisturbed ground <coughs> for years and to germinate only when the soil is disturbed. During the trench warfare of the Great War, the ground was well and truly disturbed with pigs and shovels and bombs. The poppy thrived. In Flanders Fields, the Poppies Blow was a poem written early in the war by a, a Canadian Lieutenant Colonel John McCree, who still had a, a romantic view of the war. And indeed, the poem was the inspiration behind the use of the poppy ever since in memory of the war dead throughout what was then the British Empire. Later on in the war, in the killing fields of Flanders, a different flowering took place, that of poetry. Not very romantic poetry, exposing the brutality and stupidity of war. Wilfred Owen, Siegfried Sassoon, Francis Ledwich, for whom on his death in 1917, his patron and commander, Lord Dunsany, wrote, destinies shook and the earth shook, and as the war, not yet described by any man, reveled and wallowed in destruction around him. Francis Ledwich stayed true to his inspiration. Basically, this poetic eruption declared, you can kill this human individual, but you will not kill the human spirit, the spirit that remains immortalized in these lines. Led by the likes of Jeremy Paxman, we have seen a stampede of publications seeking to normalize the Great War as viewed through the eyes of the time. This approach is wrong because as seen through the eyes of the time, Siegfried Sassoon was treasonous. However, time's magnifying glass shows that Sassoon was correct. It is now a commonplace that the First World War was futile and stupid. Even Blackadder, not to mention such movies as Gallipoli, acknowledged that the Great War was a machine for the extermination of superfluous youth. Since the Napoleonic Wars, soldiers were never meant to return. Those that did 
became only a nuisance and a guilty reminder. So while many young men of 20 said goodbye to take the king's shilling, almost to a man, the few that returned were shunned and ostracized when they came back alive. So the fat, the flat fields of Flanders, when all the guns and soldiers had either been buried or cleared off, was pockmarked with holes and trenches, mounds and embankments. In Flanders, a field was a field, in which for each hole there was an adjacent mound. For each trench, there was a parallel embankment. As time passed, the mounds and embankments gradually eroded back into the holes, and today the flat landscape is restored to its original aspect. Here and there, the landscape is pockmarked with battalions of gravestones. standing to attention and their accompanying monuments to facilitate the politicians on their yearly pilgrimage with their crocodile tears and wearing the obligatory poppy in their lapels, lest we remember. Less than 20 years after the armistice of the Great War, the war to end all wars, the battle lines between culture and bestiality, between civilization and barbarism, were again being drawn up. This time, artists writers, poets, musicians from all over Europe and further afield converged outside Madrid to form a thin line of resistance against Franco and his forces, who, returning to Spain after a spree of raid pillage and terror in Morocco was out to overthrow the elected government of the Republic. As if in resonance to the indomitable spirit of the dead poets of the Great War, these men and women lined up against Franco's army. Their resistance cry of no passeran, you shall not pass. <laughs> still inspires those who resist barbarism today. From the English-speaking world, Orwell, Hemingway, Laura Lee, were joined in turn by their counterparts from other cultures. Picasso captured in painting the extermination in total war of the Basque town of Guernica in a portrayal that still has such resonance that in 2003, when the US Secretary of State, Colin Powell, presented the case for war against Iraq in pursuit of Saddam Hussein's weapons of mass destruction, the UN workers, oops, the UN workers were required to cover the tapestry reproduction behind the podium. Artists are ever at the forefront of defending culture. But where were all the scientists? Do scientists not represent the human spirit? Were they too busy perfecting the bombs and bullets? perfecting the trajectories so that the missiles would accurately hit the target, 
that they gave no thought to the targets themselves. Were they still victim to the horrific academic destiny of specialization, leaving politics to the politicians, economics to the economists, and our value system to the theologians and the religious? So let me make a big statement now. Science conditions philosophy. And let's go to one of the dominant philosophers of our age, still dominant today. Immanuel Kant was the great philosopher of specialization of Newtonian mechanism, where the, the world is perceived as a universal machine made up of independently existing parts interacting blindly with each other. Science, being a part of the world, had its own theory of knowledge, but it was not one that could unite all of the ways of knowledge. For Kant, Synthesizing a coherent picture of the world requires that man connect the isolated fragments of scientific knowledge with other forms of knowledge, some of which are accepted solely according to whims, sympathies, opinions, and morality, etc. A synthesis from such disparate sources required for Kant and out of this world, transcendent guarantor. Kantian thinking is rampant today. The economic, ecologic, and humanitarian crises are each compartmentalized into separate domains. Obesity in the West is seen to have no connection to starvation in Africa. Unrest and war are seen to have no relation to the arms industry, which, after all, is only chasing a good business opportunity. The mountains of obsolescent waste generated daily <coughs> is seen to have no relation to the depletion of the Earth's natural resources. And the teenage suicide epidemic is seen to have no relation to the subtle change in their young lives from being a blessing to their parents at birth to incurring a debt of gratitude to those same parents for their simple existence. We parents are lucky when our teenage children only engage in sullen rebellion against this state of affairs. In our economy, the guarantor of all decisions <coughs> and policies is the market with its invisible hand. From the point of view of the market, <coughs> in spite of what well, it used to say, I don't think it says on the modern dollar, but there's still dollars in circulation that has this on it. Despite what it says on the almighty dollar, God has long been dead, as has any value system that prioritizes other than market values. The market, on the other hand, is very much alive and very much kicking. It must be forever satisfied, humoured, and its moods, as measured by the appropriately named Moody's <laughs> must constantly be reported on and commented on in the press. In 
mind view. The discovery of the Higgs boson. You were wondering when I was going to get to this Higgs boson, I know. Well, they didn't come to the room. I didn't come to this lecture. The discovery of the Higgs boson heralds the end of the Kantian separation of the theory of scientific knowledge from the theory of knowledge in other domains. I hope to demonstrate that the meaning of the scientific concept of field, we've met it already in Flanders, is itself invariant across different domains of knowledge. And its meaning can lead us to a less fragmentary understanding of the current economic, ecologic and humanitarian catastrophes across the globe. The Higgs field Higgs field is over on your left hand side. The Higgs field has the ability to confer rest mass onto the Higgs boson and onto the other elementary particles that manifest with mass, such as onto electrons. The process bears an uncanny resemblance to humanity's ability to confer value. Value is a human construct. For instance, a spoon has no intrinsic value outside of its use in our human culture to eat soup. It is of little use to a polar bear. The value of all commodities, the values of natural resources, and even our value system itself, arise from the system of culture established by humanity's existence and its social practice over its entire history. Commodities get an additional explicit contribution to their value from the individual labour expended in their manufacture. And indeed, they would not exist without such. Value therefore resembles Hegel's spiritual substance, something that cannot be reduced to an individual's experience and activity, but nonetheless is kept alive only by the individual's incessant activity. My contention here is that the resemblance between the concept of rest mass in the quantum domain and the concept of use value in the symbolic human domain, a resemblance that reaffirms the appropriateness of the nickname, the God particle. The God particle comes, the nickname comes from this book by Leon Lederman, who is a Nobel Prize winner in physics, so he, he knows what he's talking about. But he, this, this is the nickname, that, this is the man who gave him the nickname. The, the nickname, the God particle for the Higgs boson, illuminates a possible cut through the complexities of the market. Because we're told, oh, we can't do it. It's too complex. It's too big to fail. It's too complicated. We can't intervene. I think, no. If we can understand this connection, I think we can see how we might intervene. Hegel also described the individual psyche as a particle of the spirit. So Hegel is intriguing for us because he uses the terms that we use in quantum mechanics. And he, he was here 200 years. Here's Hegel, our two quantum theorists. Hegel developed a quantum theory in the philosophical domain a hundred years before it was developed in the physics domain by Max Planck. So now, let's get to 
quantum field. Quantum field theory. This is what you all came for. <laughs> that diatribe is done with. For the moment, we'll be back to it later. So, all the complex structures that we see in the world are held together by four fundamental forces. The gravitational force. We walk on the ground under the gravitational force. We would be, we'd be floating around if there wasn't such a thing as a gravitational force. The electromagnetic force, the weak force, and the strong force. In each case, the fundamental objects carrying the force and the objects feeling the force, wait for it, are zero dimensional point particles. <laughs> this is what we learned in school. What was a point? What is a point? It's a nothing. It's just a location in space. That's a zero dimensional point particle. Okay, and I'm just going to say, I'm not going to try to explain that. I think we have to believe in it. Okay, now as yet, the gravitational force has resisted being incorporated into a consistent theory with the other three. The other three have been unified in what's known as the standard model. And let's, um, let's baffle you. That's the standard poster of the standard model. You can see that on the middle here I have gravitational, weak, electromagnetic and strong. There are the four forces and we'll mention little bits around it for the moment. So this is the standard model. And the standard model has now been confirmed. This is what the experiment at CERN did. It confirmed that this is correct. Up to this point, this is correct. This was a, pro a, a hypothesis up to now. It's now correct. <laughs> Current speculative thinking is that it might require a one-dimensional object, such as a stream, for gravity to be in successfully incorporated into this theory. But who knows? We don't know. Of the four forces, Gravitational and electromagnetic forces are the most familiar. They are long-range forces. So many of their consequences are detectable on our human scale. On the largest scale, gravity dominates through the formation of planets, galaxies, and clusters. All the things we saw out in the dome earlier today. Electromagnetism produces other interesting structures such as tables, chairs, ourselves, cats, through solid state and chemical forces. The strong force and the weak force have no classical analogues. They are short range forces that have no obvious effect on our human scale. Each force has an associated charge. It's kind of like your phone. You need a charge. Electric charge being the most familiar, that's, that's what we call it. Charge is what we in our world call the electric charge of our phone. The charge associated with gravity is mass. So nothing too mysterious there. Or energy. Einstein said mass and energy were the same thing. Unlike the photon, 
which is a light, which is a massless bundle of energy traveling at the speed of light, all other fundamental particles have mass. With the result that the gravity force couples to everything. The charge associated with the weak force goes by the name of flavor, of which there are six. <coughs> Strawberry, vanilla, chocolate. No, they're, they're called up, down, strange, charm, bottom, and top. I do prefer, prefer the vanilla one myself. There you go. And the charge associated with the strong force is called colour. So that's what physicists come up with. They don't have the imagination the rest of us might have when it comes to labelling. Now, each type of force, so we have four forces, each type of force has its own field. Each field has its own particles, which can further be classified into two groups, depending on their intrinsic angular momentum, also called spin. Particles with integer spin are bosons. Here's that list. There are bosons on this side. Particles with half integer spin are called fermions, the things over the other side. Fermions, the electron is a fermion. Fermions like to pair up so that the half integers double up become to become integers. They like to pair up so that the composite entity has an integer spin, forming therefore bosons. When they couple up, they're forming bosons. Atoms and molecules with filled electron shells, these things we learned in school, are bosons. So most of chemistry is governed by this tendency this pairing tendency. Clusters of bosons tend to be very shy and try to make themselves invisible. Mm -hmm. Molecular solids are bosons. Water is a boson. White sturdy is a boson. Window glass is a boson. <coughs> Quartz, silicon, or, or, silicon dioxide, the, the glass used in fiber optics, which would, would have been my specialty. The most transparent glass in the world, silicon dioxide. <coughs> Sugar, salt, diamond, perspex, most things you can think of are bosons. And they're all transparent. They're all invisible. So as anyone who's walked into a glass door will know, just because it can't be seen doesn't mean it's not there. Um, the superconducting state, this is a medium that is absolutely transparent to electric current. So a different type of transparency is the result of the clustering of electron pairs called Cooper pairs into the mother of all boson clusters called the Bose-Einstein condensate. Now this is what you came for. <laughs> Time to play. It turns out that the most invisible state of all, the vacuum, is also a Bose 
Einstein condensate. Generally, each type of field has its own vacuum state. The gravitational field, with its charge of mass, has the Higgs field as its vacuum state. In order to account for the masses of the elementary particles of the other fields, the three other fields of the standard model, the Higgs field has to be added in by hand. So this is one of the reasons why the conformation of the Higgs boson and by implication the Higgs field is very exciting for physics, as it may now suggest a clearer way towards a grand unification. And physicists may now be able to see what they're seeing. Now, we're going to get technical here. <laughs> we're not too having technical already. <laughs> The empty space of our popular imagination. We are going to refer to this as the bare vacuum. This is not an adequate image. Wood's relativity theory and its famous equation, the equivalence of um, mass and energy, E equals mc squared, is incorporated into quantum mechanics to form quantum field theory. In quantum field theory, what we shall refer to as the physical vacuum, quite distinct now to our imaginary bare vacuum, is conceived, the physical is conceived as consisting of particles and antiparticle pairs endlessly being created and annihilated. Now in classical physics, the concept of field is retroactively constructed from the forces between the particles. The modern concept of field is now understood to be the material background from which particles and antiparticle pairs themselves are constructed. So the material background. So in quantum field theory, just like in Flanders, a field is a field. Watch, what's what happened to the field? Ah, it doesn't do. This is the field we're all familiar with. You go out and dig a hole. That's a field. This is our most, look, it's taken us this long for quantum physicists to catch up with the rest of us. This is what a field is. This is what, this is what the, the physical vacuum in quantum mechanics is. Now, the physical vacuum is the ultimate field. If a particle is created in the physical vacuum, and what I mean by a particle is anything above the surface. If something appears above the surface, since it cannot be created out of nothing, a corresponding antiparticle must also be created. And what do we call the associated antiparticle? A hole. That's the best that quantum physicists have come up with to describe the antiparticle. It's a hole. So our particle is up, is up above ground. The antiparticle, the hole, is below ground. That's the best we can do. And it's taken us this long. And we've spent our years at university learning that. It's unbelievable. Right, in the electromagnetic field, 
The particle is what we call the electron, and the antiparticle is what's known as a positron, and it's also called a hole. Now, if an entity mysteriously appeared in the field for which there was no hole, that means somebody has got a sweeping brush and swept up the field from all around to get a big amount. So the level of the total field must have, been, must have gone down. Nothing, it cannot be created from nothing. Neighbors 
who want to know about it too. A wave of clustering passes through the room. It may spread out to all the corners, or it may form a compact bunch which carries the news along a line of workers from the door to some dignitary to the other side of the room. Since the information is carried by the cluster of people, and since it was clustering which gave extra mass to the ex-Prime Minister, then the rumour-carrying clusters also have mass. The Higgs boson is just such a clustering in the Higgs field. Okay. I think that's good. So the understanding is that in the early universe, as the hot gas of particles created in the Big Bang expanded and cooled, just as water droplets condense as if from nothing on a cold window pane, a condensate of Higgs particles emerged all held together by their mutual interactions in a suspension which forms the background through which all other particles propagate. So the Higgs field is a Bose-Einstein condensate, existing as an invisible energy field everywhere in the universe. A Mexican wave type of clustering of the field gives rise to its fundamental particle, the Higgs boson. This is what is meant by the wave-particle duality in quantum physics, where the wave is a particle. One of the fundamental statements to draw in, fundamental statements of modern physics. The field also continuously interacts with other particles, such as electrons, which become slower as they pass through the field, a phenomenon interpreted as the inertial property called mass. If the Higgs field did not exist, particles would not have the mass required to give to gravitationally attract one another and would simply float around freely at the speed of light. Mass is not generated by the Higgs field as if created from nothing. It is, however, transferred to particles from the energy of the overall field. Now, I'm going to get to my <coughs> very political explanation of the Higgs field. So, not only is the bare vacuum the empty space of our popular imagination. When we think of the vacuum, we think empty space. That's an inadequate image for the ground state of a field in modern quantum physics. In the language of phase transitions, it transpires that the bare vacuum requires more energy than the physical vacuum. Get your head around that one. The Higgs filled physical vacuum is energetically cheaper than the Higgs free bare vacuum. Something is cheaper than nothing. So we have a dilemma of two vacuums. We have two vacuums. We have our bare vacuum that we imagine, and we have this thing that we're now calling the physical vacuum. And we're going to examine the enigma of two vacuums. And for some reason, our format has slightly shifted, but we can still get the general message. Um, we have the bare vacuum, it's Higgs free requires zero energy. The physical vacuum is Higgs filled, requires less than zero energy. And we're going to 
going to look at the, so those two vacuums, we've mentioned them in the physical domain, and we're going to look at the two vacuums in the symbolic human domain. Sorry, I, I should stick to my script because the script is usually better than what comes out. <laughs> so we're going to examine the two vacuums in the quantum domain and the symbolic human domain. And in the quantum domain, we're going to take the electromagnetic field as our map, because we kind of understand, know a bit about electrons and current in that. So we're going to examine the electron-positron pair creation in both the bare vacuum and the physical vacuum. And since money is the mother of all symbols of value in our human domain, our symbolic human domain, we are going to also examine two types of double entry, particle antiparticle, double entry money creation in the modern economy. We're going to talk about ex nihilo money in the bare vacuum, human free, and real money, which requires the human. And I'm going to say this analogy is, for me, I think it's on so this is why I'm talking to you. But let's go back to the electromagnetic pair production. Pair, pair is the particle, particle and the particle pair. That's what we're talking about when we're talking about pair production. So let's go to electromagnetic pair production. And the man who taught us this was this guy. Paul Dirac. Paul Dirac. Are we any second <coughs> leaving certain students in the room? Slightly. If you can't quite see it there. But that, his the famous equation is on his plaque in Blumen, Westminster Abbey or something. The Dirac equation. The Dirac equation is. Constant up there. A constant times the derivative of something equals another constant times itself. So the derivative of something is equal to itself. So I call it a self referential derivative equation. Right. Now, we've got to imagine we're in this unphysical thing called the bare vacuum. In the bare vacuum, we have nothing. And what the Dirac equation allows us to do in the bare vacuum is that if a fluctuation, whatever that means, happens, out of nothing, we can create a positive energy electron only if we simultaneously create a negative energy electron. So that the total energy is zero. So we haven't added any energy to this, to this bareness, but we can create two electrons, one with a positive energy and one with a negative energy. We leave aside for the moment what anything with a negative energy might mean, because that's complicated. But for the minute, we just go for it. So our bare vacuum, so this level here, I won't touch it. <laughs> this level here is zero energy. All right? And Dirac equation, the Dirac equation says that we're allowed Energy or the electron is allowed to reside at different energy levels, and this is what the horizontal lines are, the blue lines, are different levels of energy above zero. An electron can sit in any of those levels. But he also says that if we go down into this negative energy, the red ones, 
an electron can sit at any of those, right? So from no and at zero, we, if we create a positive and create a negative, we've kind of created nothing. We haven't added any energy to this. We haven't needed to put, we didn't put any energy in. This just spontaneously happens. But this is what Dirac's equation allows for. We can have this spontaneous formation of a positive and negative, provided they happen together. Is that okay? Now, the amazing thing happens at this point is that if an electron is in a positive energy state, and if the electron jumps down to a negative energy state, it emits energy. The energy of the difference is emitted. And this is what happens in an electric light bulb. We put a current through the wire, it excites the electrons to high energy states. The electrons are jumping down, back down to low energy states, and when they jump, they emit a photon of light. That's where our electric light comes from. So this is not a, this is not a strange phenomenon. Electrons jumping down and emitting energy happens all the time. So, but now, watch this. I have an electron in a positive energy state, created out of nothing, and it can jump. And when it jumps down, it can emit energy. I have, oh sorry, I forgot to say this. Those energy states go all the way up to infinity. And these ones go all the way down to minus infinity. So if the one up at the top jumps down to one of the red levels, I'll get energy. But if it jumps down to a red level, it can always jump down further. It can keep jumping. So as it jumps down, energy. Jump down more, energy. And this goes down to minus infinity. So it can go on jumping forever and giving us perpetual energy. That's what the Dirac equation says, if I start in the bare vacuum. Is that okay? And not only that, the one, the electron that was created at a negative energy level, it too can keep jumping down and emitting energy. So these two electrons created out of nothing We have perpetual motion. Both of them will give us an infinite amount of energy. Because we're going to keep jumping. It goes down to infinity. And as we know, infinity, there's no such thing. It just keeps going. So we have here perpetual motion. Or a total catastrophic. Because if an electron is created, it'll, it'll go down to negative. The world as we know it couldn't exist. So this is the ultimate catastrophe. But yet, this comes straight out of Dirac's equation. If I start in the bare vacuum, this is what I'm going to get. And the process of jumping down, that's called, in quantum physics, is called annihilation. And we'll see why that might be a relevant word for us later on. <coughs> So this perpetual annihilation, perpetual jumping down, is the ultimate fantasy of an infinite energy supply, or as a catastrophic instability. So both of those options are impossible in the physical world as we know it. There isn't an infinite supply of energy in the physical universe. And in the physical universe, we know that electrons do exist and persist in positive energy states. But we wouldn't have atoms if they didn't. So, in order to deal with the physical impossibility that Dirac's equation uh, kicked up, um, Dirac made a strange postulate. He said that 
all of the negative energy states. Anything that could possibly be down here. He said, they're all already full. He said that that infinity, that goes down to infinity now, remember, this is infinity. He said, they're full. And with that statement, modern physics began. Right? And he called that state, where all of these negative energy states are filled, he called that the Dirac Sea. Because it's a full sea of electrons, full up to the brain. Right? And this, if you like, is the physical background, the physical vacuum, of our electromagnetic field. So the physical, and one of the physical backgrounds, because we, as we now know, we have four physical backgrounds. Because we have four forces, we need four different vacuums. But this is the vacuum associated with the electromagnetic field. And he said that the low energy state is already fit. We call that the Dirac C. I'll show you a Dirac C after the lecture tonight. I've got it contained in my little tabernacle over here. Now, an electron, this electron, to exist, it has to jump through up to the first blue level. And that big gap, if you like at the start, that's referred to as the rest mass or the rest energy of the electron. It's only when the electron has that amount of energy that it has a little bit of mass. Up until that point, it doesn't really exist. We can't call it an electron. It's only after it has gone up, as I say, at the bottom of the blue, it's achieved its rest mass, and then above that, it can move around a bit as well, because that's where the energy might be manifested. So the first bit of energy of the electron is getting its mass, called so-called rest mass. Okay, and the same for the negative ones. They have to reside. Their rest mass is a gap in the negative direction. Right. So the surface of our Dirac C starts at below zero. Okay? So we have a negative energy surface on the sea. So the surface of the sea, Dirac, the Dirac sea, has a kind of surface tension, like water. We can float things on water. We seem to have surface tension on. This is kind of like a surface tension. And that surface tension is, if you like, the Higgs field. That's where the Higgs field resides. It's only after we've got this full C that we can get into actual pair production, particle, antiparticle production. So if an electron jumps out of the full, okay, we've got our next slide. Here's our next, this is, this is now the physical vacuum. We have all of the red, levels, each level, sorry, there's two electrons allowed in each level, so we have two electrons, the two dark red stripes are electrons filling every, every. so there's, that's, and so they're full, upstairs are empty, there's nothing, see we, we have holes, we blue holes upstairs, but that means they're empty, they're waiting for an electron maybe to jump up. So, if I want to get an electron, into a positive energy state, I need to put energy in and I need to give it enough energy so that the electron jumps from the surface of the red up as far as the bottom of the plate. That's the least energy I need to put in to get it to jump up to a positive energy state. So if an electron jumps out of the red level up to the blue level, 
I have created an electron, because that's what I understand by an electron, is something in a positive energy state. But what's left down below is a hole. Okay? So I have an electron up here and I have a hole. And it's the hole, that's the positron. That's the antiparticle. So like the, the hole in the ditch we dug earlier, this is a hole. And that is the antiparticle. So particles and antiparticles in the physical world needs an input of energy and then I can excite an electron to an upper level. Is that okay? Okay, I have two more animations. We're going to skip them. We have enough trouble tonight. <laughs> The issue of a mortgage 
Let's look at what happens when a bank agrees to issue a mortgage. It also creates a double entry by entering two equal numbers into its account book, one on the debit side, one on the credit side. Once the house, okay, we're talking about a mortgage for a house that's there. We're, new houses, that's a different thing, but we're just saying this, we're selling on a house that's there, it exists on the street. Okay, so nothing new has been created. It's, the house is just there. So once the house changes possession, one of the numbers gets transferred into the credit side of the seller's account. The other number gets transferred into the debit side of the mortgagee's account as an interest-bearing debt. Once the house purchase is complete, the two numbers in the buyer's and seller's accounts cease to have any organic economic connection to each other or to the house. The house, all the house did was set the numerical value of the numbers. So in this way, the new money that appears is a creation from nothing. And this money is referred to as ex nihilo, out of nothing, or nominal money. I'm not inventing anything new here. The number in the seller's credit account is new money. It's added to the existing money supply. But no new physical output has been produced. So the money is spread over the same real economy as yesterday's. The prices of existing stock increases. So inflation of the money supply, which is a sort of borrowing from the past, is the first burden that the wider society must bear as a consequence of ex nihilo money creation. The other side, the interest bearing debt of the mortgagee. Okay, that's repaid in installments over the term of the loan. The additional money, as that is, uh, as that is repaid, the additional money in the economy is gradually withdrawn and the original integrity of the money supply is restored at the final repayment of the capital. <laughs> Any money that is used to pay interest on this mortgage must therefore come from somewhere else in the economy. The payment of interest, which is sort of borrowing from the future, is therefore the second part that the rest of the economy bears from this manner of creating money. Now, we cannot deny both sides of the ex nihilo double entry of the mortgage transaction causes real activity in the economy. So there is an illusion that both sides are real money or assets. This illusion gives rise to the stock and bond markets where these assets are reissued by the banks as more additional money into the economy. <coughs> And there is no stopping point to this reissue. The process can continue ad infinitum. So this is kind of like our electrons falling down and down and down. The, the banks, okay, for, for normal ex nihilo money, the bank is allowed officially to lend it on 10 times. And the shadow banking system in 2007 and 2008 they were lending it on per day, lending it on 60,000 times. So the infinity, this is the infinities I'm talking about. So this is what occurs in the perpetual monetary self-expansion and speculations and self-referencing derivatives and futures options that 
about all trading on our own fears and anxieties, which are created by the volatility of the external world itself. So the vicious circle leads to a world where insurance is the fastest growing industry. They refer to insurance as an industry, as if it was a baker baking bread, doing something useful. So the meltdown of the global economy shows that the economic system, based on the creation of money from nothing, has no basis in physical or economic reality. Yet the recycling of this new money into the economy does trigger real economic activity, whose material base must therefore be located in depletion somewhere else. But now, armaments, universal debt, and planned obsolescence. In failing to acknowledge that the value of the money in our economy arises from social humanity itself, the economic activity stimulated by money created from nothing becomes grossly distorted. When commodities are produced for their exchange value alone, a bias in production is to make products that add nothing to society's culture and heritage, but generally subtracts from and depletes it. Products for which the presence of a logo more than doubles their price, for which nothing definitely costs more than something. This is Aldous Huxley. In this book, written in 1963, he put it over 50 years ago. Armaments, universal debt, and planned obsolescence. Those are the three pillars of Western prosperity. And indeed, the beginning of the 21st century sees the United States, the most powerful country in the world, configured as a war economy. It sees the economies of Europe dismantling their welfare states in order to save the banks. To repay debts that can never be repaid because the structural foundations of the ex nihilo money economy is a bottomless hole. It goes down to minus infinity. Already the past century has witnessed a litany of human annihilations in disastrous and universal wars, barbarous exterminations, ethnic cleansings, work camps and gulags. The double burden caused by ex nihilo money drives companies into unrestrained production on an ever accelerating treadmill of raising profit by simultaneously putting the environment, polluting the environment and exhausting natural resources, meanwhile destroying the conditions for sustainable human, animal and plant life. The double burden of ex nihilo money exacerbates third world starvation and humanitarian crises by extracting interest on debt coupled with the laying waste of the local economies. The double burden of ex nihilo money subordinates everything to market forces, leads to the debasement of arts, letters and education. But worst of all, the double burden on human society, coupled with the arithmetically impossible demand of balancing the bank's books, is unleashing a savage, destructive nihilism on humanity and human civilization, in deed and in thought. So, so we don't leave here in despair. <laughs> Even our children can see it. This is one of my children when he was in primary school. But, uh, so, is there a beacon of So when the engineer and scientist Paul Dirac 
declared that the bottomless sea of negative energy states is already full and was therefore the new basis of physical reality. This was of the nature of an axiom, a self-evident truth. It could not be proven from the vantage point of the bare vacuum, where in fact the bottomless hole could never be filled. The Dirac postulate could only be enunciated from the vantage point of physical reality itself. When confronted with the contradictions of perpetual motion and catastrophic instability associated with the creation of electrons from nothing, modern physics had to decide that the Dirac postulate was true and to proceed in fidelity to this decision. The experiments in CERN have now confirmed the existence of the Higgs boson and the Higgs field, which in turn confirms the existence of the electromagnetic physical vacuum. It is no longer a postulate. When confronted with the impossibility of perpetual monetary self-expansion and with the economic, ecologic and humanitarian catastrophes caused by the assumption that money can be created from nothing. Modern humanity must now assert that the proper material basis for economic and monetary value is its own existence and social practice. So from an understanding that ex nihilo money is a debt to society at large, it is a small step to see how the current economic crisis can be resolved without fear of unravelling the whole economic system by simply restoring the market value created by human society to human society and by restoring the market value created by the private individual to the private individual. Finally making sense of Jesus's, since we're talking about the God particle, Jesus's enigmatic statement, render unto Caesar what is Caesar's, and render unto God what is God's. That our existence as human beings provides value, that these human values may not be reduced to market values goes without saying. And indeed, those values have traditionally been dealt with by religious and moral codes, etc. However, it turns out that human society's contribution to market values can be exactly quantified in concrete market terms and can therefore be restored to human society in exact measure. And this is hardly rocket science, let alone nuclear physics. Yet, I think it has taken the CERN experiment and its analogy with the human symbolic domain to fully reveal it. Dare we assert, as scientists, that this new experiment in science is a reminder of the 2,000-year-old Christian message of the rejection of the false gods of the market and money in favour of human flesh and blood. So when God died on the cross, he handed over to the Holy Spirit. He placed his trust in us, the invisible multitude, the scum of the earth to take charge of our own affairs. So the flash of light confirming the Higgs boson is like the star in the east, signaling a new beginning for the human spirit, the Higgs field of human existence, when humanity finally trusts in itself and dispenses with the invisible hand of the market, 
Humanity must declare that the unfathomable debts to the banks are already paid. That the bottomless hole of bank debt has already been filled. Enough is enough. Failing such a declaration, humanity will be consigned to digging a different hole, to digging its own grave as a card in Flanders a hundred years.